the kind introduction. I'll be the chair for this morning's session with the very difficult task controlling the time, try to be strict about it, to the best of my capabilities. Um, this morning, first speaker, our set. This is me. Is Roland Kawakami Roland. from yes. the Department of Physics of the Ohio State University. He's going to talk about 2D magnets. Yeah, yeah. So, Welcome um, to the stage. Yeah, I will talk about 2D magnets. So we have uh, two sessions. This will be great. Um, yeah, it's like there's, it's like a trilogy. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Star Wars. Okay. Uh, we didn't quite finish this first one. I know, but yeah, this yes. I don't know. We shall we shall find out. I don't know what side I'm on yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, we will. Most of this session will be like the Empire Strikes Back. The middle, you know, it's when people, you know, the first movie is kind of like, yeah, you know, you're trying to make a good movie, and then the second one, you're just goofing around making money, selling tickets. All right, we're going to goof around a lot. Um, there's going to be derivations and things like that going on, sort of. Um, <laughs> and, and then, and then um, you know, and then the last will be 2D magnets. We're just going to, there's going to be tons of stuff. I'm just going to be whipping through. It's like a finale, like a fireworks show, okay? Uh, hopefully, it'll work like this. Um, I have a question, though. I have a question. Bilayer graphene. Bilayer graphene. It's a quiz for any one students or non-students. If you had bilayer graphene and you apply an electric field perpendicular, do you guys know what will happen? Yeah, what it will do? Yeah, yeah, breaks the mirror symmetry and opens the gap. It does. A lot of people know this. That's good. Do you know, anyone know, like, what's the, spins, the spin structure at the gap? You know. Uh, now, in fact, I didn't know that. Uh, he knows too. Yeah, you, yeah. He you, you wrote the paper. <laughs> so um, let me tell you. Let me tell you what the spin structure is. Not everybody knows this, and so I want to go into actually um, some work that we had done. And what slide is this on? What slide is this on? Okay. So let me. Let me try to find where we are here. So uh, we were talking about um, spi proximity spin orbit, Yarrow stuff, Sergio stuff. Very nice. Anisotropy equaling one is significant. OK. OK, so, okay, so here's a, a really cool experiment. And I guess it hasn't been done yet. Um, but, you know, you can take, we're talking, here's this Yarrow's idea here. You take bilayer graphene, and then you put it onto some TMD, and then you can tune with a gate, you know, this proximity spin orbit, the spin orbit coupling. So here the spin orbit coupling is strong, and here it's weak because the electrons are, the carriers are far away. So this is a, a beautiful idea. It's called, it's called spin orbit uh, valve transistor, something like this, right? That, okay. Got to do this. Got to do this. Got to force my student to do it. Okay. And so, so he's working on this, and it's like, wow, all this crazy stuff's happening. It's great. We're going to, like, write the paper on this spin orbit valve transistor. It's so good. And I said, okay, but you know what? We should do a control measurement. Like, do that thing without the TMD. Right? And then and I said, then we can just write it up because it's all good. And so this was done. And it was crazy still. It was absolutely crazy still. I was like, oh my gosh, what the heck is going on here? It was very tough. So let me tell you what's, what, what goes on. OK, so here's the deal. Yeah, so you do know this. You apply the electric field, and you open up a gap. And this is like in a photo emission measurement. Eli Rotenberg uh, did this very famous work, photo emission. And you can sort of see the gap opening or closing, depending on the electric field. Yeah. and. Experimentally, the way that you do it is you have a top gate and a bottom gate. And then if they're the same sign, you're going to change the carrier density. And if they're opposite, then you're going to create this electric field. Right? So you could sort of um, do a map as a function of top and bottom gate. And then you could uh, you know, redo the variables so that one axis will be the electric field. That's the vertical. And the horizontal is the carrier density. 
And if you look at this is the resistance, you can see that as you increase um, the electric field, the resistance goes up, right? And that indicates the gap is opening. So this is the, you know, the transport version of what's going on up here. All right, cool. Now, here's what is cool, which I didn't understand, which, you know, confused me a lot. But it turns out that if you look at the band edge of the gap, there's this spin structure, and it's like this valley zeeman spin orbit coupling, very similar to what you have in MOS2, right? Where you have a spin splitting, the orientation, uh, preferred orientation is out of plane, so the effective field is out of plane. And in the K valley, the spin up is on top. And in the K prime valley, it's the time reversed, so its spin down is on top. So this is the story. Uh, but the thing is, the splitting is really small. It's like about 24 micro EV, right? It's not MEV. Like in, in MLS2, it's like 150 MEV. It's huge. And this is like tiny. So it's very similar to the TMDCs, but the spin splitting is tiny. Okay. And this was all done by, uh, oh, everyone's here. Oh, three of the four are here, right? Martin is here. Dennis is here. Yarrow is here. Very nice. Okay, good. Okay. That's really good. So then there's, there's sort of a prediction that you can make about the spin lifetime anisotropy that we talked about, right? So if you're, if you're um, and, this, and these, these are out of plane oriented, so um, the spin orbit field is out of plane. And then if you're parallel to it, you're not going to process. So this whole diakona Pharrell business is not going to mess you up. I don't know. And, but if you are, if you are um, spins are in plane, now this field is going to process it like crazy, and it's going to make this spin lifetime shorter. So there's a very specific prediction of this kind of spin structure. And it all comes down to you know, um, measuring the anisotropy of spin lifetime using these various methods that was developed by this fellow here, Sergio. I just copied that. Good stuff. Okay. All right, so that's good. Oh, and I should say, yeah, I mean, well, okay, I won't even go into that. So here's the data. Here's the data. So here's the device with top gate, bottom gate. And um, we look here, and, and we look at the resistance map. Yeah, so it's a spin valve with, with the bilayer graphene with the top gate, and then the bottom gate is the whole substrate. And we just look, and we do this kind of, one method is the in-plane Hanley, where the spins can process from in-plane to out-of-plane, so it's sampling kind of both, right? So if we do, if we do the, the normal Hanley, which is out of plane, so this is for the bottom one. I'm sorry, this is for both of them. But the point is that if you, if you are far away from the charge neutrality point and you do this kind of Hanley measurement, it looks like a regular type of Hanley curve. So like, okay, everything's normal. But as you get closer and closer and, uh, to the gap and the gap opens up, you start seeing these big lobes, which is characteristic of having uh, a large uh, spin a lifetime anisotropy, right? So it's about four or five here. Okay, so these big lobes. All right, so that's pretty. That's pretty good. And then you could do it the other way, which we talked about, which was the which was the oblique Hanley, where you you know tilt the magnetic field out of plane gradually, and then you look at the spin precession and you look at the um, the uh, saturated signal, and you plot it against cosine squared of that field angle. And so remember, along the diagonal line, uh, if it goes along the diagonal line, that means it's, uh, the spin anisotropy is like 1. So it's, not, it's isotropic, nothing going on there. But if you go close to the gap, you get this thing that's way above the line. And in this case, the anisotropy is about 12. OK, so yeah. And so this is what you expect for that kind of spin valley coupled spin structure, where out of plane, has a much longer lifetime than in plane. So it's about 12. So out of plane is 7.8 nanoseconds, and in plane is less than a nanosecond. Right? So this is the signature of that kind of uh, spin valley locked band structure. And so we did a little bit more. You know, we basically did this, um, mapped it out. Here's the out of plane spin lifetime. Here's the in plane spin lifetime. And here's the anisotropy ratio. So basically, whenever you're opening up the gap, and you're sort of exposing the band edge, which has a spin split structure, then you can, you can have a very large uh, spin lifetime anisotropy, right? And then, but if you're far away where the gap is closed, you're much closer to one, okay? Yeah, so this is uh, two things that are nice. You're actually having an electric field gate control of the spin lifetime, and it's actually, we're seeing intrinsic band structure effect, spin orbit effect in graphene, 
which is kind of very surprising to me because throughout the entire field, it's like, yeah, your, your devices are too dirty. You'll never see intrinsic spin orbit effects of graphene because you know, they're too weak. Um, in this one, it just happens. It's, it's all along one axis, and it actually exposes itself like right here. So I thought that was like really cool. So our group had done this, and also Bart Van Wies' group. So we published back to back. And uh, yeah, so that's uh, kind of a cool, a cool story about bilayer graphene and this spin valley coupled spin structure. OK, so yeah, so I didn't show this at the end of the first uh, l last time, but you know, the main topics were there was some spin transport and graphene. There's various types of spin orbit coupling. And these Hanley measurements are really nice to get spin lifetimes, identify proximity spin orbit effects, and even some of these um, intrinsic uh, spin orbit couplings inside of graphene. So, right, so there we go. I think uh, well that's the end of that talk. So I'll just pause for the moment if there are any questions at all about, yeah. So I noticed that uh, spin transport and isotropy, uh, you also have value below one. I'm just wondering if this is also uh, understood from the theoretical side, or you had like maybe you have a blue regions where it yeah. was really well below one. So, do we understand that? It's a little below one. I do not understand it. You don't? You don't? I do not. Do you understand? I don't know. Do you? No, you. Yeah, I'm not sure. So we maybe at, this at, high en uh, at high energies, this could happen. It could go to one half or something. It was lower than one half. Oh, uh, it's not lower than one half. Maybe it's not lower than one half. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Sorry. So it was down to one half. You you found this value. Uh, no, I don't yeah. think it's uh, as low no. as one half. Okay. I mean, yeah. I guess. Point eight or something. Oh okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, because the color cannot really. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry for interruption. So, um, okay. So to be honest about that, that those were done by mapping the in-plane B field, and it's less accurate than the oblique. Um, I don't think it's I fundamentally um, less accurate, but if you, you kind of need a three-axis vector magnet to make it more uh, reliable. I forget the exact detail why. So there's the numbers on the map. I, I'm a little less um, you know, um, confident about you know, just quantitatively, but this oblique is good, yeah. You also have the rotation of the thermagnet for the in-plane one. So that uh -huh. makes it uh, more difficult because you rely on the, on the shape of the yeah. handle. So that's why I think it's less accurate. Yeah. 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 So th yeah, basically for us quantitatively, we trust the um, oblique one more. Yeah. We, we like Sergio's. We like Sergio's. <laughs> it's good. OK. Um, OK. OK, so we'll move on to the um, Empire Strikes Back. OK, here we go. So yeah, so this one and the very opening of the third one, I'm, I'll just have, I, I'm having some fun with this. Uh, time is good. All right, so we're going to talk about optospintronics and optovalletronics. And I'm just going to talk about two experiments, one which is mine and one which is not mine. OK, so uh, one is Valley Hall effect, and then the other is optospintronics with TMD graphene. Can't spell. OK, that's fine. OK, so this is um, a really nice experiment. And it shows this Valley uh, Hall effect in MOS2 transistors. And Stefan showed a slide of this. Um, yeah, so this is uh, for students especially. OK, so, so let me show you. This is the only data I will show you on this. So here's the experiment. Um, this is a monolayer MOS2, and then there's four electrodes on it. And on the horizontal side is uh, attached a voltage source, which is, uh, produces a current. Okay? And then on the top and bottom, A and B, is a voltage probe, which is going to measure the Hall voltage. Okay, so that's what that is. And um, 
What's going to be done is I right in, the, in this junction, uh, circularly polarized light is going to excite electron hole pair, okay, like exciton, but then they split split up, okay. And what the what the uh, circular polarized light does, there's this optical selection rule, where um, it will only excite in one of the two valleys. I didn't draw the band structure, but this is what it is. Most people know, but if not, this is what it is. And so you end up populating electrons and holes only in one of the two valleys. So here's the K valley, okay? And then, based on what valley it's in and whether it's an electron or a hole, anyways, it's gonna deflect. So, so these holes get pushed to the right by the electric field, but they deflect, they get a transverse velocity because of the valley hull effect. And then this one, the electron's going the other way and it will deflect like that because of the valley hull effect. And this creates a net charge current, which creates a voltage at between points A and point B, and that's what's measured, okay? And technically speaking, this is like inverse valley hull effect because what's going from left to right is a valley polarized current, so the light cr makes this a valley polarized current or a valley current. And then what's created is a, a charged current, so it's like valley to charge, so that's like inverse valley hull effect, okay? And I learned early on from Sergio that <laughs> microscopic of valley, a spin hull effect and inverse spin hull effect is like the same. It's like, you gotta think about it a little bit if it's the first time to hear that. Okay, and then so the main data is over here. So this is the, the hull voltage, which is the voltage at A minus voltage at B. And then bottom is the, uh, is the bias, uh, voltage or the current essentially that you're pushing through and then so when there's no when there's no bias there's no signal but as you start driving it say to the right then this transverse voltage builds up sort of proportional to the current that you're driving the charge current that you're driving or well this this current that you're driving okay and then opposite it goes down and so that's the data and then they do a couple of checks they flip the helicity so because they, they they actually are, are doing right and left with a modulator so you go from right and then the left, and you subtract the two. And then so you can do left minus right. Okay, that's an okay control. And then you do it with linearly polarized light. You do it with a bilayer, MOS2. So all of the measurements act the right way. Okay, so valley polarized current generating transverse charge current. So that's the inverse valley hall effect, which is the valley hall effect. Okay, all right. So I just wanna play around with a couple of questions, so which I want I like, I like all students working in these areas to know about. So here's the first question. Okay, here's the first question. How does the optical absorption work? How does it work? Okay, some people think about this a lot. Some people don't think about it at all. Okay, <laughs> okay. Well, okay, let's see. Here's how it works. This is a famous diagram. This is from Dijow's 2012 paper. Well-known diagram showing valley dichroism. So, you know, this is MOS2. There's a little bit of splitting in the conduction band, but most of the splitting's in the valence band. On the K valley, the spin up is on top, and then the minus K or K prime valley, the spin down is on top of the valence band, okay? And um, you do the sigma plus, like RCP type of light, and that will excite in the K valley, regardless of whether you're on the spin up side or the spin down side. It, it doesn't care about the spin so much, it cares about the valley, okay? And um, this one, uh, you know, it's sigma minus, it cares about the valley, but not which spin level it's from. So it's really valley dichroism. Okay, everything still sounds good, right? Sounds good. Okay, so um, does anybody know what's weird, but what I'm gonna animate in next? Just curious. Yeah, this is what's weird. Okay, this is what's weird. Because um, my poor students, you know, they have atomic physicists on their qualifying exam committee. And then this, they, they ask like, what orbital, what's the orbital transition there, right? They say, oh yeah, no, well, if they know, if they've studied, it's like, oh yeah, there's a d orbital here. So, th so the top of the valence band is like this d x squared minus y squared plus or minus I, D, X, Y, depending on if you're in K or K prime valley. You know, it's like this thing, 
It's the thing that looks like this. The orbital looks kind of like this. Okay? You're like, okay, it's a d orbital. And then in the conduction bottom of the conduction band, it's the dz2. So these are both molybdenum states, and they're both d orbitals. And then you tell an atomic physicist, yeah, yeah, you go from d to d. And they're like, no, that's impossible. That's impossible for optical dipole transition, right? That's an odd thing. So normally, what you expect is something like in gallium arsenide. This is our prototypical semiconductor, right? You have the conduction band. It starts, it, it originates from s orbitals. They get put together and they become a band, right? And then there's these holes, which are start from s p orbitals. They come together, they make bands, right? And then you have this optical transition. It takes you from p to s, and that's like totally good because s is uh, even under parity and p is odd under parity and the dipole matrix element is odd. So you put them all together and you're good. Is, am I right, Michael? Oh no. <laughs> These are not accurate numbers. For I mean, it, these I'm are not accurate numbers for, or good quantum numbers for the system, right? It has broken inversion symmetry. So the S and the P are, are labels for the atomic states that make it up, but yeah. the symmetries uh, are not preserved. So for example, okay. you can make a transition from the, okay, so if this were, if this had inversion symmetry, the reason that you would be okay making that transition is that the valence states are bonding and the uh, conduction states are anti-bonding. Actually, has nothing to do with whether it's S or P. It has to do with right? the symmetry okay. around the, the point of symmetry between mm. the two atoms. Mm. And so what that means is that um, if you had still inversion symmetry, you okay. could not make an optical transition from the conduction band to the next conduction band, from yeah. the S to the P conduction band, which are both antibonding. Uh -huh. But in fact, in gallium arsenide, because it has broken inversion symmetry, you can make that transition. So, uh -huh. I mean, I think... The the resolution here is that you also have broken inversion symmetry. So, okay. At least okay. I hope. I don't know. I don't know what the you'll tell us what the answer is. Well, you know what? I might be not right here, but uh, but but um, I'm d I, I cannot guarantee I'm right on all the details. How's that? I just have a, a spirit here. Okay. So um, that's okay. So this is this is sort of the answer to for here. So I might be wrong about the whole. I might be wrong about the whole gallium arsenide, I'm sorry. I used to work in that system. I guess I didn't really do my homework. It's okay <laughs> for me. Okay, so, <laughs> so um, let me, let me uh, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's just focus on this for a moment. So, <laughs> so this is um, what we have in the MLS2. And it, the, the, the point, though, which I think is true, is that it's not an atomic transition at all. Um, in fact, it involves uh, current loops through the crystal, right? So here's the molybdenum, and then you can, they're coupled by, let's say, in tight binding, or you, you'd have a hopping matrix element that connects the different molybdenums here, right? And over here, okay? And so I just drew these T's on top of uh, off, uh, the image in the paper. But, you know, you can actually calculate, what was calculated in the D. Zhao paper of 2012 is this optical coupling matrix element. Uh, for sigma plus and sigma minus. And you have a bunch of stuff here, which I'll, the only thing I want to point out, which really um, I think is cool, is that you have a T, T squared. The hopping is required for the optical transition. So if you just didn't have hopping at all, you would have no optical transition. So it really involves uh, some current loops, some orbital current loops that happen throughout the crystal. So it's really a transition that really relies on the crystal structure itself, not necessarily the specific element. So you end up seeing a, lo a lot of materials have this kind of same structure as MLS2 does, and then they have a similar kind of optical transitions and, um, you know, valley selection rules and so forth. Even if it's made out of very different materials, even some, you know, you would expect to see it even in, like, say, magnetic uh, TMD materials as well, for example. Yes? Yeah. Uh, oh. We need a, they're recording you. No, I, I think this is very consistent because the nature of the inversion symmetry breaking is dependent on that hopping, right? The, and so that's how it shows up in the matrix element. So that, that's all good. Thank you. Yes, I have fun, I have, this is good. Um, 
So, um, so, um, so this, this takes me to my second question, which is, um, you know, uh, some t I like talking to theorists, and sometimes, just like now, I feel like, wow, I don't know what's going on. And I, don't always often, don't I often don't know what's going on, but that's okay. So the second question is um, the Valley Hall effect. Okay, so the Valley Hall effect, I'll just say it comes from Barry Curvature, but where does Barry Curvature come from? Okay, so um, many theorists have told me the following. Um, MOS2, that's really heavy. It's got a lot of spin orbit coupling, you know? So, you know, the Barry curvature is coming from spin orbit coupling because it does something to the spins, and there you get it. Because, for example, in a lot of topological materials with Dirac cones and so forth, um, the Barry curvature does come from spin orbit coupling and the real spin being spin momentum locked and so forth. That is correct, right? Right? Um, so so I, I, would, I would, you know, I'm, I'm talking about MLS2 and Barry curvature, and they're like, yeah, it's, it's really the spin orbit coupling. And I would say, I don't think it is. I don't think it is. I don't think it is. Because I've been studying this with my student. I don't think it is. But many theorists would tell me, especially the ones who are working on topological materials, that, it, yeah, that's what it is. Okay. Um, then, uh, you know, I was at a conference. I actually met Kin Fai Mok for the first time. And I was like, you know, this, you know your Valley Hall effect? You know, I don't think that your this, this Barry curvature is from spin orbit coupling. I think it's from this other thing. And he's like, yeah, it is. He's like, yeah, you know. And, and so we sort of, um, at that time, agreed that most people think it's spin orbit coupling. And, and since he told me also that it was not spin orbit coupling, I was happy. I was like, okay, this is good. So let me, let me tell you about this. Okay, because the natural answer would be it's spin orbit coupling. Okay, so this is a bunch of formulas, which I will go for, especially for students to go over. So this is like what MOS2 looks like. It's like it has a gap. Um, there's a second band I that's not drawn there. This is sort of the band edges. So this is the dashed line is energy versus momentum. So the two valleys. And then there's this Berry curvature, which has peak near the k and k prime points, and they have opposite sign, and, okay, I don't remember if this is for electrons or holes, or, okay, so, but you have something like that, so there's Berry curvature, this omega in red, Berry curvature, okay, so Berry curvature is there, okay, how does it get there? I'm not going to go into the total detail of how it got there, but um, once you have the Berry curvature, it's directly connected to the Hall conductivity, so it's going to give us the, tr so the, it's going to give us this transverse volta uh, velocity, so this is sort of um, one, way to, one way to look at it. And then the other way to look at it is in terms of velocities in this kind of um, semi-classical picture, right? Where like the velocity is the derivative of the you know, energy with respect to k. And then there's this extra term, which is the anomalous velocity term. So the very, very curvature, will, will, well, in 2D materials, we'll take this to point along z. So this, so this will be perpendicular to k dot, which is like, along the applied electric field. So the K dot goes with the electric field and there's the Lorentz force as well, okay? So basically, um, imagine this, this Berry curvature as a vector, it's pointing out of plane. The electric field is horizontal, so it's gonna create a velocity that's vertical. And that's the, that's the Hall effect. And y you know, so these two are kind of different ways of saying the same kind of thing. So this is the Fermi-Dirac distribution. You integrate the Berry curvature over K space, the, the essentially the occupied states, and you get the Hall conductivity. Right? So that's Hall that is the transverse. So it's all good. It's all they're all intimately connected to Berry curvature, which exists here. And when you notice that in the K valley, the Berry curvature has opposite sign as the K prime. <laughs> okay? So therefore, the velocity is going to have opposite sign, and the Hall conductivity is going to have opposite sign. So that's why the K valley electrons will go in one direction, while the K prime valley electrons will go in the other direction, right? And so you end up getting a net valley polarization current in the transverse direction, but you're going to cancel off the charge current. So this is the direct valley Hall effect, you'd say. You know, you start with a, a sort of a charge current and it creates a perpendicular spin current. Okay, so that's kind of the picture, okay? Okay, I, I will not go into what exactly Berry curvature is in Berry space. 
questions, yeah. Yeah, uh, where, uh, what is your conclusion? Depends on the uh, smell pretty interesting or not. Okay, what's the conclusion? <laughs> there we go, okay, okay, very good. Okay, MLS2 has large spin orbit coupling, but the Berry curvature in MLS2 does not come from the spin orbit coupling or from the real spin. That is the conclusion. And I wanted to try to uh, make this believable without going into like, I mean, there's a very famous 2010 review article about Berry phase effects in solids, and there's like t lines and lines of equations and all this stuff. And I said, and I want to minimize it so I don't like go through all that stuff. So not the definition of Berry curvature, or this or that. Okay, but okay, so I'll do it like as follows. Okay, what the heck happened here? This is wrong. This is not good. Okay, I'll just delete that and start. Keep going. I don't know how that got there. Okay, so we'll look at Berry curvature in three materials: one's graphene, one's boron nitride. And one is MLS2. OK. So the band uh, and graphene is all carbon, and there's two lattices, A sublattice and B sublattice. You do the tight binding stuff, you do all that stuff, and then you'll get like two Dirac cones, one at K and one at K prime. We're all familiar with this. OK? And, um, and then you could also calculate not just the energies, but you can calculate the wave functions, right? And these wave functions are linear combinations of pz orbitals on A and pz orbitals on B. So I call this one and two, but it's pz orbitals on A, pz orbitals on B, and their superposition. So those are the two basis states, and that's it, okay? And then you solve it, and you can write A and B as a little spin one-half vector, and that's called the lattice pseudospin, <laughs> okay? And then, so if you talk about, see graphene, and there's a pseudospin chiral thing, and they all point radially and stuff like that, that's what, that just represents um, the A and B coefficients of this wave function. Okay, lattice pseudospin. Okay. All right, let's go, to, let's go to boron nitride. Boron nitride is very similar, except for um, the two elements are different, so their energy levels are different. Um, and you can think in terms of symmetry. Now you've broken an inversion symmetry, so graphene has inversion symmetry, which sort of protects this Dirac point. But now you've broken it, and you create a gap. Okay. But it's still very similar. It's, 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 a, it's like a graphene with a gap, essentially. Um, and now you have the same wave functions except for the phi 1, which is like, you know, this is a block state. Um, that'll be a pz orbital on the boron. And then the phi 2 will be a pz orbital on the, um, on the nitrogen. And then, you know, the linear combination, A plus, you know. And then you just take those coefficients, you draw them like a spin one half, and that's a lattice pseudospin again. Very nice. Okay. Let's go to MLS2. MLS2 is here. Um, and MLS2 looks, look, looks a lot more complicated. It's three dimensional, right? It's, it's like uh, three atomic layers. But if you look from the top, it looks the same. There's molybdenum and there's sulfur here. That's like good. And then if you work it out, um, you end up having, it's similar to boron nitride, except for you also have this big spin orbit splitting because molybdenum is heavy. So your valence band gets a big spin splitting where the K, the top level is spin up and the bottom, uh, uh, and the um, K prime, the top level is spin down. So you get this big spin orbit splitting, okay? And your wave functions, though, are going to be written in terms of, no, it's not totally, I hope it's okay. Okay, so I can imagine if, there could be some spin or actual spin orbit effects that go into this too, but you know, basically, uh, the states at the top of the bands, the, 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 t the states that are involved here are, they're all on molybdenum, okay? And then one of them is this dz squared of molybdenum, which I mentioned uh, when we're talking about optical transition. And then there, at the top of the conduction band is this dx squared minus y squared plus i dxy, okay? So these are the states there. So these are the two primary states at the gap. And you can write those as a um, super, uh, as a linear combination, and you can write that as a vector, one spin, one half, A, a B. We, we don't call that lattice pseudospin because it's not A and B sub lattice. They're both on the molybdenum, so we'll just call that pseudospin, okay? All right, so, so those are the three band structures. Okay, I'm going to sort of s if scroll up. No. <laughs> no. Okay, sorry. I don't know why that's there. Okay, let me delete that. Okay, so um, let me get back here. Okay, 
All right, so I just rewrote this lattice pseudospin. Now, let's look at the Hamiltonian, right? So for graphing, the Hamiltonian is, well, this is from that paper. It's A T times tau, which is the valley index, Kx, sigma x. And this is a sigma, this is poly matrix for pseudospin, um, lattice pseudospin in this case. And the more, nor the more common way that's written is like h bar, Fermi velocity, sigma dot k, where k is the momentum and sigma is the lattice pseudospin, okay? So that looks pretty good. Now in Bohr nitride, it, like, it's the same, but you add another term, which I you can think about it as a mass term or it's a gap term, where it, it's as, uh, it goes along as sigma z and there's a delta. So this is like the gap in Bohr nitride, okay? And then if you go to MOS2, it's like the same thing, except you also have this other term, which, um, in at this level of modeling, there's n in the conduction band, there's nothing going on, but the valence band has this big splitting of lambda. And then th there's the real spin here. So it's saying that it's, it's splitting open the real spin in the valence band is what this last term says. So this is what MOS2 looks like. The point is they all look the same except you just start adding extra terms, okay? So huh, this is, I don't know how this has infiltrated my, it's okay, <laughs> okay. Suspense. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it strikes back. Yeah, okay, okay, <laughs> okay. So now I'm going to put it all together here. So basically, in graphene, you have these Dirac cones, and it just turns out your Berry curvature is zero everywhere except for at right at the Dirac cone. It's like a delta function. So if you sort of if you traversed around it, you would get Berry's phase, but it's like a singularity at k and k prime, and they have opposite signs. Okay. If you open up the gap, then this Berry curvature is spread out more, so you have some of this kind of stuff here, kind of some of this kind of stuff there, o opposite signs. And then, um, you know, basically the MOS2 has the same, because the Hamiltonian is basically the same, you have the same type of action um, as well. And the thing is, these all come from the same place. Um, graphene and HBN have very low spin orbit coupling, and they have this kind of action going on here. And MOS2 has large spin orbit coupling and it still has this kind of action. I could imagine that having spin orbit could modify it quite a bit, but the origin of it all is coming from a, a pseudo spin, an orbital type of thing, and not from the real spin. Okay? And, and it, yeah, related to crystal structure too, you have to break inversion symmetry and do other things like that. And it's, it has threefold rotation and things like that. So, so, so the lattice that a lot of 2D materials have uh, are good for getting Berry curvature from such type of effects. Okay, so this is my, okay, I will, I will, I will, okay, I will pause. Yes. Oh. So, like, the, the way to, to bury curvature is to look at the coordinate operator. So, coordinate operator is I yeah. H delta over, I delta over delta mm -hmm. K plus, Berry connection due to confining wave functions to the manifold with index n. Yeah. And then if I have inversion symmetry and time result at the same time, I can see that Berry curvature, which is the curl of the Berry connection, yeah. has to be zero. So yeah. to have a non-zero Berry curvature, I must break inversion symmetry yeah. if the system is time result invariant. So in other words, Berry yeah. curvature is a code name for my system is inversion symmetry broken. Yeah. But your graphene is not inversion symmetry broken. Yeah, but it's zero everywhere except for some singular points. So like, I have this, I have a, a discussion with a theorist, and I, I, so I don't understand what happens at singularity, is, is my point. Uh, yeah, so um, if, you if, you take the Berry if you take the Berry connection and you went, uh, you went around a loop around the K point, you would get a net Berry phase. Even though everywhere along the path, your Berry curvature is zero. Well, you know, there yeah. is a kind of operational uh, way, to, way to know, like, is my Berry curvature, Berry connection zero, non-zero, which is you shine light. And the key thing is, do you get photocurrent without any bias voltage? Uh. So I'm saying, and that's what you we see in calculations as well experimentally, if yeah. you shine light on graphene, you're never going to see photocurrent in the absence of bias voltage. But if you punch holes in graphene, mm -hmm. or you put graphene on something else, yeah. and you break inversion symmetry, mm. 
Then you can get what is called shift current or circle of photogalvanic effect, this kind of stuff, which yeah. is charge pumping by light, like Basically. some time dependent field, yeah. in the absence of any bias voltage, which because you broke the yeah. symmetry between left and right. So yeah, there's, a, very, there's mm -hmm. a simple operational definition. I just shine light on whatever you are discussing. Yeah. If I see the current flowing without any bias voltage, that thing actually has some kind of battery connection, whatever, sure. uh, or properly inversion symmetry. I don't even have to talk. Like I could formulate everything yeah. without ever mentioning this concept yes. because in calculations mm -hmm. there are many ways to calculate this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I and mean, so, like, yeah. so none of these systems, either graphene or HBN, is going to actually respond to uh, the photocurrent uh, induction with bias voltage. No, graphene, um, if, if somebody else wants to talk, that's good. But the graphene, if, it's on, if it breaks, if it's on some substrate and it breaks the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. 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 But if you like, if you put it on HBN, if you put it on HBN and you, um, yeah, you break the inversion symmetry and then you'll get, you'll probably create a small gap and then you'll create some very curvature. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think in graphing it'll be zero, except you know you have the singular points at the direct point. So I don't know. Yeah. Mathematically, Barry curvature yeah. is a code name for my system is inversion, bro inversion symmetry broken, non central yeah. symmetric. And I don't okay. have anything to do with spin. It's purely orbital stuff yeah, yeah, about yeah, yeah. block wave functions, yeah, yeah, yeah. confinement to a given band. Yeah. But like when you do, so I mean, the thing is, when you do a quantum Hall measurement, you get like this Barry phase when, the, when you go one time around the K point. Even though there's no Barry curvature there, there's just this. Going around this singularity at K point um, has a physical effect in, in that sense, in that case. So, yeah. Okay, so, so yeah. maybe just a comment. So, yeah. if you have a system which, uh, which is time reversal uh, symmetric, then the overall Berry curvature over the Brillouin zone is zero. It's, 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 it's a mathematical statement. It has nothing to do with inversion symmetry or not. So graphene is inversion symmetric. There is also light absorption at the K points because you have E to the I K something which gives you the dipole moment needed. And you can have at the, and that's why you have at K, at K prime exactly opposite very curvature, so the sum is zero. So if you break the valley symmetry by whatever, time reversal symmetry, then you can have this valley hall effects and address it by light or whatever. Very, that's very nice that you you raised this point because it's I think it's central, and uh, and also to echo your your comment yesterday I showed that uh, when you do not break time versus symmetry you actually have very curvature yeah in the case of this uh, magnetic field uh, this strain induced pseudo magnetic field so you don't break time versus symmetry but you have a finite very curvature at each valley with opposite sign so they, the, the the consequence is that you do not have any observable effect of this Berry curvature. But, but Berry curvature relates to the topology of the wave function. And when you, you want to have an observable, you measure the whole conductance, for instance. And, uh, and so that, that's a point. Sometimes the, the you can observe manifestation of the Berry curvature and in through the whole conductance, and you will have a churn number that will, be the, will determine uh, the quantization of the whole conductance, and sometimes it's just not appear because this this is cancelled, and uh, so I think that that's a great point that you raise because uh, everything is is actually uh, I think we are all agreeing with that, but it's actually depending on the on the property of the wave functions and their mm -hmm. correlation somehow when you start to move uh, those wave functions and you look at their correlation. So that's 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 a kind of topological property of these wave functions. Yes. Very good. Okay. All right. So well, this is great. We're right on schedule. Okay. So uh, second part of my talk is uh, optospintronics on MOS2 graphene, and this is an experiment that one of my students uh, Kelly Kelly did. I really really like this. Um, 
So it's this idea, you know, we've been talking a lot about proximity effect and heterostructures, and this is not about proximity effect per se, but it's really trying to take advantage of the best properties that you have of graphene and uh, MOS2. And what's nice about graphene are these long spin diffusion um, lengths and so forth. And what's good about the MOS2 are these optical valley selection rules. Okay? And so we want to try to bring them together and to take the advantage of both. Right, so graphene is tough because there's not a spin-dependent optical selection rule, and for MOS2, uh, the the spin transport is not so good, although the material is improving all the time. Okay, so okay, we know about the optical selection rule, so we're going to use circular polarized light to excite, um, uh, you know, electrons from valence band to conduction band. Um, like this A exciton resonance, which is from the top of the, the top valence band, and the B one, which is from the bottom one, which has opposite spin. Okay, so we want to do this, and so what we want to do is we want to uh, do the following: we want we want to take MOS two and create some spin polarization with the light, put them inside, uh, connect it with graphene, and have uh, the spin actually get transferred from the MOS two and into the graphene. And to verify that this is happening, we're going to want to detect it uh, using a ferromagnetic electrode, just like we do in these graphene spin valves. Okay, and then we want to apply a B field so that we can process the, the spins to point along the axis of the ferromagnet. Okay, and so I will mention that, so we have done this work, and also uh, Ahmed Absar, who's here, and his experiment did a different material and also had an out-of-plane field so, to, so it can actually polarize it um, polarize the ferromagnet out of plane. So they did it in a different way and their results are all consistent. Okay, all right. All right, so we want to have a spin injection, optical spin injection, a lateral spin transport, and electrical detection, right? So this is sort of trying to demonstrate how versatile uh, heterostructures can be in terms of spin. Do they get preserved and so forth? Okay, so to begin this, um, we have a device like this. This is a, a gra piece of graphene that has been cut down, etched down. And down here is a region where there is MOS2 on top of graphene. Okay? And out here is just graphene. We have cobalt electrodes and some gold electrodes. And what we do first, just to make sure if the electrodes are working, we do these spin transport measurements um, without any light, um, where we have parallel and anti-parallel. We ramp the magnetic field. We get parallel and anti-parallel, and we see these kind of switchings like we had um, in the first tutorial. And then um, we also apply an in-plane magnetic field along Y, which will cause spin precession. And this it's this out-of-plane spin precession, and we see spin precession. And then so that's how we identify electrodes as working. So here we go. And then to do the experiment, what we do is we take an optical excitation, and we hit the MOS2 region, and then we hope that it, like, it diffuses into uh, the graphene and gets detected by electrode, in this case, number six. Okay. All right, so this is actually the data that comes out of the, so let me have this, uh, where do we, what do we measure? We, we actually measure, we use the C6 as the detector and then we use G2 as the gold reference electrode, so we measure voltage across those two. And we know from the spin valve studies that that can detect the spin uh, accumulation inside the graphene at electrode six. Okay, and this is actually the data that comes out as a function of the precession field, the, the magnetic field. So we start here, so to understand this data, we look at zero field, so when you inject it, it's out of plane, and then it, it, when it gets to the detector, it's still out of plane, and it's perpendicular, so you get a signal of roughly zero. Okay, and then if you apply a little bit of field, like here, what will happen is as the spins go across, they start processing. And as, as you get the field bigger and bigger, you get more precession, so you get more component of the spin along the magnetization, so it's growing. And then if you go to even a higher field, you'll sort of start to over-process, right? So now you've gone over the max, and now it's starting to come back down. So this is a Hanley curve, but it's like sort of like the anti-symmetric Hanley curve because we're starting off at 90 degrees apart. So in every other Hanley curve we had before, the injected spin and the detector are parallel or anti-parallel, okay? So you'd always see a peak or a dip. But if they start 90 degrees apart, you're gonna get this kind of characteristic anti-symmetric Hanley. 
And then to really verify this, we want to flip the direction of the magnetization and all the signals should flip. Yeah, and that's what happens. So we flip the magnetization and it flips around. So yeah, so this is very nice. It's a Hanley measurement. So you know that it's really coming from spin and it flips with the magnetization, so this also verifies it. There's a little bit of a background, we're not sure exactly what that's from, but typically measurements have some background. That's why you flip the magnetization so you know what the spin component is. Yeah, so this is a verification that the signal indeed is coming from the spin. Okay. Now, an interesting thing to do is to play with the photon energy. Right, so I didn't tell you, but that data was taken at this A exciton resonance, and here's where he goes, 1.93. And then we can change the photon energy, and here's what happens. So let me actually go back one. So we just take this mi minimum to maximum as the, as, the, as the magnitude of the signal, delta V non-local. Okay, that's the spin population. And we do that as a function of photon energy. So we just change the photon energy and repeat the experiment. Here's a few representative curves. Here's the, the, the big one that I showed. And then if you go to shorter wavelengths, or shorter photon energies, it's a little smaller. Higher photon energies, it's a little bit smaller. And then if you go even higher, it flips over. Okay? So you can sort of plot this out. So, so this is where the first data was. This is at lower energies. There's higher energies. And then it is a flip. And this actually corresponds to when we hit the B exciton resonance. It's opposite spin. That's why the signal is flipped over, as one would expect. Right? So you can control the magnitude and also the direction of the optically injected spins just by tuning the photon energy. Okay? And we could even take this up to room temperature. So we go up to room temperature and we still get these features. Now the signal is a little bit smaller, but we still have all the features here. Okay? You know, positive, negative, and so forth. We do some modeling on this. Uh, we do some modeling, it's the ty type of modeling we do for, for regular spin transport. We inject at a certain point, there's some relaxation, and then this is uh, the different um, fields, so we can actually model the precession, okay? And based on these kind of fitting, we can actually uh, estimate uh, efficiency of this process. So the optically injected spin current, so we actually have a photo current, it's uh, 160 nanoamps. And from, the, from this kind of modeling, we actually are estimating, oh, this is the spin current, sorry. We're, we're estimating an efficiency of about 5%, so 0 0.05 spins per photon absorbed. Right, so we can still further improve this. I think if we had a material that had, say, a longer spin value lifetime than MOS2, this could help. Okay. Okay. And then we wanted to understand a little bit more. Um, you know, what's the mechanism? Is there sort of a picture of what's going on here? And for example, one thing is that we can, the sign of the photocurrent is kind of interesting. I mean, at some level you might think, why is there any photocurrent? You have an exciton, and then it could recombine, and then you should get, should you get anything, right? So some folks are like, yeah, why do you get anything? <laughs> um, I don't know. So, so but we did this, and for example, you know, we would look at um, this junction where we excite into the MOS2, and then we go into the graphene, like this, and then we measure the... Um, uh, photo current including the sign and we for example change the intensity we change the gate voltage and what we find is that it's always um, uh, this positive side okay so what's happening is we're getting a uh, photo current that's dominated by whole transport so wha why is what's going on here okay so we turn to our uh, theorist actually Igor Zudich and um, he and his postdoc Tong Zhao did a very nice uh, DFT modeling. I said, I, I really need to know what's happening here. And so this is a very nice, this is a very nice calculation where you can see um, the, uh, the heterostructure is calculated and then you can calculate um, sort of the band alignments. And essentially, uh, there's a charge transfer based on the band alignments where um, you end up with a built-in electric field, right? So electrons go from here to there and you get a built-in electric field, right? And so, so the sort of this, this sort of semiconductor-like diagram is you have a band bending, and this is all on atomic scale. So this is very different from, you know, semiconductors where this kind of, you know, depletion region can be very large. This is all sort of happening at the atomic scale, right? But what happens is you can create an uh, electron hole pair, and then they get to uh, this point, and with this built-in electric field, it, it pushes out, 
the holes, it breaks apart the exciton. And uh, yeah, and so this is this built in electric field that gets created by this equilibrium charge transfer is actually what's driving the holes to be going to be the dominant carrier in this uh, in this uh, uh, spin transfer. So I found this to be very nice. Okay. Oh, no conclusion slides. Okay, so wow. Okay, so uh, yeah, so we talked about. Valley Hall effect. We talked about optospintronics. Um, are there any questions? Yes, yes. So, from the uh, description of the Valley Hall effect, and you know, which looks very uh, consistent and sensible, the question is. Uh, do you or anybody else see a Valley Hall effect in HBM? In? HBM. HBN. Um, it's an insulator that doesn't have carriers. I don't think people do transport in it. Is there so a way? So you can't dope it? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, does so I mean, the, the direct prediction from what you have is that there should be, right? if you dope it, you should get a Valley Hall effect. I think I don't know. I don't know if people have doped it for conduction. Is there surface channels or something? I'm not sure. All right. Yeah. All right. So um, yes, I want to go back to the first question that um, Ranslav actually yeah. the co his comment because I think I didn't quite underst understand uh, what Yaroslav and, and Stefan explained. So I I know the argument that. I mean, Pratislav said, which is quite general, right? If you have inverse symmetry, um, the very curve omega of k is equal to omega of minus k. And if you have time reversal symmetry, omega of k is equal minus omega of minus k. Kind of like the usual argument for time reversal symmetric uh, uh, system. So, if you have both inversion symmetry and time inversion symmetry, you have to have zero. So I, I, don't, I don't understand. Can you explain to me? I, I really don't understand. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So I said exactly what you said, but there is something uh, mathematically, pathologically in graphene which has nothing to do with physics. And so the pathology is that uh, the Berry curvature is a vector with three components, but graphene only lives in 2D space. And so the, the, uh, uh, the two moments are in the plane, but the third one is zero. And then exactly at the Dirac point, you can get something which looks like infinity, and then you have to regularize with a non-zero gap, and look at the limits, but all of this stuff is like useless. It's just some kind of mathematical trickery. So pathological, so like technically speaking, as you said, anything which is inversion symmetric and time was invariant has zero Berry curvature. So Berry curvature is a code name for some symmetry breaking. But there is something pathological in graphene depending on whether you consider a 3D vector or 2D vector. If you consider a 3D vector, the third component, which is actually called some kind of Berry flux, will have a pathological behavior exactly at the Dirac point, but that's useless because, you know, Graphene doesn't have the third moment. And you have to add a small gap and then look at the limit, blah, blah, but it looks like to be just pure mathematical trickery, nothing, nothing real. Okay. So um, I think what, what Roland was also pointing out is that, uh, I mean, Berry curvature, but we can speak about Berry phase, okay, which is a sim sim simple somehow because it's a, it's a property of the wave function when you, when you, Somehow you make a transformation in your in the magnetic buoyant zone, for instance, something like that. So you get a you get a phase factor that can uh, then uh, appear in some observable, and Berry's phase appear at, at a finite energy. The Berry curvature has a, as an observable consequence when you integrate in the energy. It's not a, it's not a Fermi C, uh, um, has no Fermi Fermi surface consequence. So let me let me um, um, ask a question because. I think one of the very um, interesting and puzzling phenomena is the fact that when you create excitons in TMDs, 
you can observe the drift of those excitons that actually uh, will depend on the valley polarization. So this is a paper that has been published by Wazar. I think you, you know this paper, exciton hole effect. Yeah. And uh, I mentioned this in my mm -hmm. presentation, actually. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and this is, uh, as I said in my presentation, I insisted that uh, at the conclusion of the paper is completely open because we don't really know uh, if the, the exciton is charged, is neutral, uh, what is the drifting mechanism, uh, even though we can uh, invocate the, the thermal gradient. I mean, mm -hmm. how, how, how much spin orbit coupling actually drive the, the propagation of those excitons. Exciton is a very complex yeah, <laughs> yeah. many body particles. And, and in, in, a, in a landscape where you have a spin orbit coupling field, uh, what's going on actually yeah. when you have two or three, uh, uh, two electrons and one hole or one electron and one. So I don't know if you have um, uh, considered to, to go uh, also um, beyond your experiment to address yeah. this point. And a, a second yeah. question I will have is, the mechanism of what you measure as a spin signal, which is which is coming from the uh, photon polarization yeah. and exciton formation, you, know, you could say there is a spin accumulation like the usual, or, or could you make a mapping between the usual measurement of, this of the non-local spin transport measurements and your experiment? Could you make a kind of analogy to explain what what is the correlation between what you detect, uh, non-local voltage, and what you have in the injection source? Uh, yeah, I, I think, well, for the second part, you can, and it's just modeling, and it's how much do you trust the modeling. Um, yeah, but for the first part about exciton, diffusion, and drift, and things like that, I think that's very exciting. I think Ahmed has done some nice work on this, and I think Philip Kim has also some nice work on this. Uh, we're very interested in this. We have experimental setups that could sort of do this, um, but it's just, you know, you have to sort of have a measurement and materials and everything together. But I think those are really exciting topics. Yeah. So yeah. we have already run out of time, so we just have time for one more question, and you can discuss more uh, during the, the 15 minutes of break. So I wanted Roland to ask you, uh, can you say something? Uh, don't you have some surface polariton formation in this optospintronics experiment? Cannot those also spoil the signal or things like that? Since you are having TMD, you are having a graphene, so you can induce the uh, surface polaritons in the graphene huh. and how those could uh, mimic in the spin signal you are observing. Oh, um, that's a good question. Uh, we, have, we have not thought about that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so, so we're going to have a 15 minutes break now, and then we come back for the second part of the lecture. <laughs>